you then stick that needle through a piece of bamboo, float it in a bowl of water, you have, in effect, a modern compass. It will align itself north to south. Now, it might not look like much, but with this, you don't need the sun and the stars. No matter how dark and stormy the night, no matter how bad the weather, you can always find your way home. In the mid-1400s, China's royal court decided grand ocean voyages were too great a drain on the imperial treasury and turned their resources inward. China's official journeys of exploration ended, but merchants and fishermen kept sailing immense numbers of ships, the mightiest fleet in the world. What inspired sailing technology, like much else that the ancients knew, was their observations of wind, water, and Earth. The Chinese believed a life force called Qi flowed through everything. When Qi was in balance, it brought health and peace. But when it was out of balance, it meant disaster. China is famous for its pursuit of health. For many, that pursuit is a way of life. Each day at dawn, people all over China gather to exercise their bodies, minds, and spirits. They are stimulating the healthy flow of life energy. The Chinese call it qi. They believe that the motion of the qi kept the body in balance, and that exercise helped move the qi. And that is precisely what these people are doing here behind me, tai qi. The Chinese had a proverb, be not afraid of growing slowly, be afraid only of standing still. And that, of course, is precisely what our doctors tell us today. Keep on moving. By the first century BC, Chinese doctors had worked out a theory to describe the path the qi takes around the body. They believed it circulated through a network similar to our blood vessels, but invisible. The Chinese believed the healthy flow of qi through the body also depends on blood. The ancient Greeks understood veins and arteries contained blood, but the Chinese realized it circulate. By studying cadavers, they also discovered blood vessels are connected to internal organs. Chinese doctors used bellows and bamboo tubes to demonstrate how the heart pumped blood around the body. Now, their theories weren't exactly correct. They believed it took the blood 29 minutes to move around the body, where, in fact, it's closer to one. But the important point is this. Hundreds of years before a European doctor caught on to the idea, the Chinese had got it. Circulation. They believed that blood was part of qi's yin and yang, and that a balanced flow between the two kept a person healthy. The ancient Chinese also believed the earth had its own balance of yin and yang qi. When the two were in harmony, everything remained peaceful and stable. But if one overpowered the other, the earth's qi became unstable, and the result was disaster. China has suffered three of the four deadliest earthquakes in recorded history. In 3,000 years, they recorded more than 2,000 quakes. These are the oldest seismological records on Earth. To the Chinese, an earthquake was not just a natural disaster. It was, in a sense, a deeply unnatural occurrence, a sign that something was profoundly wrong with the cosmos. The emperor was not ruling as he should. Nor was an earthquake any better from the emperor's perspective. For him, it meant a loss of tax revenue. Like any government, he was worried about food supplies, about possible rebellions. Nothing but evil ensued when the earth shook. So for the emperor, it was very important to know when and where an earthquake had struck. In the second century AD, a new invention provided him that crucial information. It was a six-foot-wide bronze seismoscope, an ingenious device invented by mathematician and astronomer Cheng Hung. There were eight dragons, one for each principal point on a compass. Each dragon held a bronze ball in its mouth. When the earth shook, the dragon facing the direction of the quake dropped its ball into the mouth of the toad below, alerting the palace. No one is sure how the interior of the seismoscope worked, but most experts believe an inverted pendulum at the heart of the mechanism controlled the dragon's jaws. 
the vibration swung the pendulum in the direction of the quake, which then triggered the dragon's mouth to open and drop the ball. Except one March night in 138 AD, the ball dropped when no one had felt a quake. Chang's invention was labelled a failure. Several days later, when a messenger arrived to tell of a massive quake which had devastated Kansu, about 400 miles to the northwest, they realised how sensitive Cheng Hung's invention was. From that time on, if a ball dropped, even if no one felt the quake, local officials were sent out to assess the damage. But if earthquakes are inevitable, the human devastation is not. On July 28, 1976, a powerful earthquake struck northern China in the middle of the night. It was the deadliest earthquake of the 20th century. The official estimate is that more than 240,000 people lost their lives, but unofficial records put the death toll closer to 650,000. That's the population of Alaska, wiped out in a few moments. This monument in Tangshan City stands as a memorial to those who died. Twisted metal rods and broken cement are all that remain of this community college science lab. Today, it stands as a tangible monument of the earthquake's force. About 60 miles from here in Qinglong County, 180,000 buildings like this one were also destroyed in the quake, but not a single person died inside. Like their ancestors before them, officials in Qinglong had carefully observed nature around them. They found clues that the earthquake was coming. They'd noticed strange behaviour in the animals, tremors in the earth and variations in the water level. They ordered an evacuation, and there was only one casualty from a heart attack. Earthquake prediction remains a very inexact science, but if we ever get it right, we may have the Chinese yet again to thank. The ancient Chinese believed that qi animated everything in nature, including human beings. They continued studying the qualities of the Earth's materials and elements. Their discoveries inspired them to keep innovating, and made China a pioneer of science and technology. Today in China, that trend continues. One of the greatest puzzles in world history is that it was not China, but the West, the divided, warring West, that went on to explore, colonize, and dominate the globe. China turned in on itself, forgetting the brilliant centuries of innovation in science and technology that had gone before. Trade and commerce passed into Western hands, the exchange of ideas, became one way. When Jesuit missionaries showed the emperor of China a mechanical clock, he was astonished, being unaware that it was not the Europeans, but the Chinese, who had invented the clock in the first place. Only in recent decades have the Chinese rediscovered their creative energies. And the results, as are plain to see, have been spectacular.